We're in the middle of a sort of teaching series just now. Um, we're exploring our values, the things that are really the foundations of all that we do in this community. And I hope by now we're starting to get into our kind of consciousness that we have these kind of three overarching values, presence, honor, and legacy. Now, why are we spending so much time looking at this? Um, well, I think we're in a season of change and transition as a church. About, well, a bit over a year ago now, we left the family called New Frontiers, and we left in, in a great way, and, and, and that's been great, but we just felt uh, moving in different directions. And then, um, back last October, we moved into a new building here with all the challenges and so on that that brings. And then, in the beginning of this year, we actually set in our, our new eldership. So we've been in this period of transition. And it's in moments like these, I think, that it's really important that we establish again who we are that we remind ourselves of what are the things that we're really going for. So I guess for some people who've been around Hope for a long time, perhaps things look a little bit different to when you first arrived here. You know, we've, we have. We've, the change has been gradual and transitioning, but actually we've been around Hope for well, 13 years now. And yeah, it really does look quite different. So... As I say, we're holding up the things that we hold dear, the things that underpin all we do. And the reason for this is that together we can you know, just grasp what, the, what this community is about. And it's our hope that we'll all hear what we're saying and think, yeah, that's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. And at the end of all this teaching and exploring these values, we're actually going to give everyone an opportunity to say their yes and amen as well. So in the same way as we celebrated setting in the elders and we had a, an amazing Sunday just celebrating and a real sense of God's presence and his hand on that, um, later in the year in September, once we've concluded this series, we're going to do something similar and celebrate all of you people. And as I say, we're going to have a chance just to say, yes, this is the church we want to be uh, committed to and uh, you know, giving our lives into. And so we're going to have a great celebration, and it's going to be amazing. Um, you know, I've been a Christian for about 40 years now, and I don't think I've ever been so excited about what God is doing in his church, and particularly here in Hope Church. Um, and... For me, there's just that real rise of excitement of what God's going to do over these next months and years ahead. So today I'm actually going to talk a wee bit about our, for our last session under the banner of, on, um, of presence. Not honor, presence. Honor's next week. <laughs> we'll start on that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the presence of God really is our number one non-negotiable priority. And if we don't get hold of this one, then actually everything else is kind of a little bit meaningless when it comes to it. Presence is the one thing that distinguishes God's people uh, from the rest of the world. And we've talked about a whole number of things that, have actually, that actually kind of flow out of that idea of presence. So Nick, um, probably over a month ago now, spoke about the kingdom of God and just our understanding of um, God's kingdom being released on the earth where we are. Um, Jan McFarlane spoke about the joy of the Lord. There's something as God wells up inside us. There's a joy and something contagious that, that God releases into our lives and into the lives of those around us. Um, Andy spoke about the goodness of God. and We know that God is good towards his people. And last week, Hannah Graham spoke just so brilliantly on faith. And I don't know about you, but it just really caught my heart, some great stories. Um, and also just beginning to touch in on um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit this morning, which is hosting the presence of God. So what I want to do is really try and tell a little bit of a story this morning of God's heart towards us of his heart to connect with his crea creation. So if we go right back into the beginning, we see God's desire to be present with his people. In Genesis, he'd created Adam and Eve. 
He created the Garden of Eden. He put them in that sort of secure place in, in you know, somewhere out in the Middle East, probably. Um, and these two people that he created. And God will come down, and we know he'd come down in the cool of the evening. He'd speak with them. He'd commune with them. And God's intention was for that intimate connection. He wanted relationship with his people. He created us in his image so that we could have a meaningful relationship with him. You know, we're not automatons. We have choices, we have emotions, we have all kinds of things which are made in God's image. And because of that, we're built for connection with him. He wants relationship with him, with us. And we have a choice whether we pursue that relationship with him or not. Now Adam and Eve, in the end, chose not to. And with that, brought this, a, a break in the relationship between God and between man. So they disobeyed, they hid from God, and ultimately their rebellion resulted in them actually being put out of the garden actually for their safety, so that they couldn't get to the, the tree, tree of life, but actually they were put out of the garden and separated from God's presence, and that intimacy was lost. And the rest of history really is the story of God and his pursuit of his creation, his unfolding plan to restore us to relationship with him. Now, if you go back into... The Old Testament, we see that actually it began just with a few individuals. It wasn't normal for people to experience God. But if you look back, there are people like Noah, for instance, who God spoke to him, the world had got evil, and Noah was this, this good man in the middle of it all, and told him, build a boat, I'm going to wipe this all out, I'm going to start again with you. And then we come to Abraham, a man who is later to be described as a friend of God. And his amazing faith story as God spoke to him, called him out from among his people, and he became the father of the nation of Israel, who became God's chosen people. And God pursued Abraham, he spoke with him, and this, as I say, this nation began to build. And we see throughout Genesis a whole bunch of different um, people who heard and responded to God. And God wanted a people to be a demonstration to the earth. The Israelites, they weren't, he didn't pick them you know, just for some random reason, but he wanted a people to demonstrate the goodness of God in the earth. And so we see them going to slavery in Egypt, and after that we see Moses who was to lead them out. And Moses had these amazing encounters with God. And the burning bush where God spoke to him and it was that, you know, God said to him, you know, take your shoes off, this is holy ground. And God encountered him there and as he led the people of Israel out of, uh, out of Egypt, we see just this amazing intervention of God on behalf of his people. So he leads them out through the Red Sea, a miraculous de deliverance, which was just absolutely amazing. The water piled up on either side. The Israelites went through, and then it closed up on the uh, Egyptian army as they chased after them. And we see, as, as they went through the wilderness, he provided food for them. He led them with a, a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. And it was just an amazing time of God being tangibly present among his people. Now, Moses actually received from God, when he went up the mountain, he received detailed instructions about the construction of a tabernacle. So this was a place where God would come and be among his people. And the place where the priests would minister, where um, they would bring sacrifices to keep the people in uh, a right place with God, I guess. And his tangible presence would come to that tabernacle. Moses would go in and he'd come out and he'd have to put a, a, you know, a sheet over his head, basically, because the presence of God just radiated off him. And it scared the people. It was kind of pretty intense. Um, so here we are, God among his people. And in Leviticus, we 
actually see some of God's heart behind this. So Leviticus, Leviticus 26. Just going to read you a few verses from verse 1 to verse well, 11, I think, somewhere around about there. So it says, so there's some instructions, and then there's also some blessings which come out of observing them. So do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourself. And do not place the carved stone in your land to bow down to it, because I am the Lord your God. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commandments, I will send you rain in the season, and the ground will yield its crops, and the trees their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest, and the grape harvest will continue until planting. And you'll eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. I'll grant peace in the land, and you will lie down, and no one will make you afraid. I will remove wild beasts from the land, and the sword will not pass through your country. You will pursue your enemies, and they will fall by the sword before you. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. And I will look on you with favor, and make you fruitful, and increase your numbers, and I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating last year's here harvest when you have to move out to make room for the new. I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. So there we see the heart of God. I'll walk among you, and I will be uh, your God, and you will be my people. His, his heart is to be among his people. And I just love that verse early on. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. Yeah, this is what really the key to all those blessings that uh, God was setting out before them. Now, here it was about lots of rules to be followed. For us, we live the other side of the cross, and so actually, for us, the blessing is unconditional. It's not depending on following the rules. Um, it's not about doing the right things necessarily. But actually, I do believe that it comes out of that reverence for him and for his presence. That reverence for the sanctuary, the place where God is. So that, that hunger for his presence remains a key to unlocking a lifestyle that releases the presence of God. You know, if we, we're flippant about God and his affairs, actually we're not going to see the fullness of all that he has for us. So we have Moses' tabernacle, we have this people of God where he will come and he'd, he'd dwell in this tabernacle. And then after this came David's tabernacle. And this was a different beast again. So Moses' tabernacle was predicated mostly on sacrifice, lots of blood and gore. So I remember back early in the year we were reading through Leviticus together and all these dozens of sacrifices and hundreds of oxen and sheep and goats and goodness knows what. And it was pretty messy, it has to be said. Thankfully, we have one sacrifice for all, so we don't have to do, uh, deal with all that stuff. But actually, David's tabernacle, again, there were no, no sacrifices there. This was a place of 24-7 worship. And David recognized that this tabernacle um, it had been captured by the Philistines and taken out of Israel. And he saw actually that it was blessing on the Philistines because they had this tabernacle, the presence of God among them. And so he brought it back into um, Jerusalem in stages. It, first attempt didn't go so well. So, so they put it on a cart with some oxen in front of it and it kind of was about to fall off and some guy put his hand on it, Isaiah, and he got struck down and died. Because again, they hadn't had this reverence for the presence of God. They hadn't looked and seen God's instructions. But in the end, David gets it right, brings the tabernacle into Jerusalem with great celebration. Um, his wife wasn't too chuffed of him dancing in his underwear and all the rest of it. And I'm sure you know the story. Um, but again, this sense of God's presence being among his people. You know, David, 
he actually reflected. You know, here, here he was living in this amazing palace, and it says made of cedar and all different things, when God was actually just dwelling in a tent in their nation. And so in his heart was built the, born the idea of building a static you know, place where God would live among his people. Now, David ultimately didn't build it, but his son Solomon did. And again, at his inauguration, the presence of God just so filled the temple that the priests couldn't stand to minister, and the nation as they gathered fell on their faces before God. So we have this Old Testament model that actually God would come and dwell among his people in a specific location in either the tabernacle or the temple as it then became. But as this era is coming to a close, we actually see two prophetic words which I guess inform... um, our view of of God's presence now. So in the book of Amos, and I haven't written down which chapter, I'm sorry, I think it's maybe six, I I can't remember. But it says, in that day I'll restore David's fallen shelter. I'll repair its broken walls and restore its ruins. I'll rebuild it as it used to be. So that they may, may possess the remnant of Edom And all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, where the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. So David shelter this 24-7 worship place. Um, fell into disrepair and moved to the temple and the focus became back on sacrifice again. Um, but God is going to restore that fallen uh, David's tent. And again, we see that in this, as, as this worship is restored, there's a blessing that comes out of it, an abundance and a fruitfulness. So yeah, David's tabernacle. No animal sacrifices, just continual worship. And I believe we're actually living in those days of this tabernacle being restored. It's referred to again in Acts 15 as well, the same prophetic word. And it was tied in uh, there by Peter as um, really tied in with us reaching the Gentiles. So it was kind of in this middle of the big debate about whether God wanted to bless just the Jews or the Gentiles. And these verses again uh, come in there. But not, so not only would worship be restored, but actually that restoration would be inc- accompanied by incredible fruitfulness and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It talks about uh, new wine dripping from the mountains. New wine always talks, it is always symbolic of the movement of the Spirit and what he's doing. <laughs> so our worship and the Spirit's moving in and through us and through our worship are keys to us reaching the lost in our city and nation. Now, it's great that, that story that Ben shared this morning as we worshipped. You know, these guys, Ben out on the streets just being who he is, carrying something of God's presence out into that place and bringing freedom to that woman. Isn't that just amazing? I love that. Okay, so that's one prophecy. We're going to have this restoration of of this worship culture, which is going to bring blessing and going to bring salvation. The second prophecy is one that we probably all know well as uh, too. It's from Ezekiel 47. So Ezekiel's in this vision and he describes what he saw. And again, I'll read you a few verses. So the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from underneath the threshold towards the east. For the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me round to the outside of the outer gate, facing east again, and the water was trickling from the south side. And just picture this in your mind. And as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits. So a cubit is about that, I think. So quite a long way and 
He led me through the water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. Another thousand, and he led me through water that was up to the waist. And another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, what do you see? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on either side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region, goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. That's pretty amazing because the Dead Sea is incredibly salty. <clears throat> when it empties into the sea, oh, sorry, yeah, swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore and there will be places of spreading the nets. The fish will be many kinds like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit, because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food, and their leaves for healing. So here we're seeing a departure from the Old Testament norm. The Old Testament norm was that God was confined within this temple, that he was kind of hemmed in by the four walls almost, so that the people will come to this point. But here we see the Spirit of God breaking out from the temple. It's kind of a, a picture, I suppose, of what happened at the cross when the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, opening up the holy place uh, for, I guess, for God to come out and for the people to come in. Yeah, so in the Old Testament, the people would gather at feast times to the temple for for blessing and for atonement um, and to just live in the blessing of God dwelling among them. But now we see the water, again speaking of the Holy Spirit, breaking out of the four walls. And we see this flow of the Spirit bringing fruitfulness again and healing to the nations. So, when we get into the New Testament, we don't have a static temple anymore. But actually, now we become the, pre- the temple. No physical building, but actually, we're, we are the temple. So, I'll just again read you a few verses. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's spirit lives among you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. But God's temple is sacred, and together you are that temple. So us together, his church, we are the dwelling place of God. But actually, it's personal as well. So 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are God's temple and that God's spirit lives... Oh, sorry, uh, Sorry, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So actually, this is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's just mind-boggling and awesome in just beyond what you can begin to imagine, really. And then 2 Corinthians 6, it says, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols. For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live among them, live with them, walk among them, and I will be their God and they'll be my people. There's that verse again. That's God's heart. To be among us. For us to respond to him as, as our God and him to respond to us as his people. Yeah, so good. So the new covenant is about us individually and corporately being hosts of God's presence. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. And as with the temple, he's not only contained within us, but as we partner with him, we actually release his presence around us where we go. God is present with us. We need to consciously acknowledge him 
We need to foster a relationship with him. And as we do that, we're sensitive to his voice. We're sensitive to his moving in us and through us. And we release that flow of those living waters. You know, corporately, we express something of this in worship. You know, in the same way as at the old Israelite temple, when they worship, the worship struck up, God's presence fell so, so that the priests couldn't minister. And so in a similar way, when we worship, there's something of heaven's atmosphere that's released among us. And I believe that as we worship in faith and expectation, we're going to encounter the dynamic and living presence of God in new ways. There's always something fresh with God, which I just love. It's not just the same old, same old, but every time we engage with him, there's something new and fresh. And as in Ezekiel's uh, vision, we actually have a river that flows through us. So Jesus taught us this in John 7, 37. It says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood out and said in a loud voice, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, let rivers of living water flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So here we go. That picture in Ezekiel of the water flowing out. And here we have now in the words of Jesus, living water flowing from within us. That's the spirit who lives in us. (laughs) So we're the new covenant temple, both individually and corporately. We have this river that flows out of us. And the effect of the river... We've already seen the, the blessing that came, was coming to the, uh, the temple that Ezekiel saw. Salt water was becoming fresh. Things which were palatable becoming palatable once more. Uh, supporting a, an abundance of life and supporting trees that were going to bring healing and going to bring, um, they were not going to wither and pe- perish. Um, and we're going to impart something to the nations. And this was really modeled to us really well by Jesus and the early apostles. You know, Jesus, I guess, was the perfect representation of God. But he's also the perfect representation of who God wants us to be as well. We have the same spirit working in us who raised Jesus from the dead. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So, we know the stories. Jesus went everywhere. He healed people. There was that particular uh, occasion where the woman who'd been unclean because of an issue of blood, and she was in the middle of the crowd, and people were pressing in on him, but she had that germ of faith as she pressed in and touched the uh, edge of his cloak and got healed. Jesus felt the power going out from him, and this woman had touched something of that river of life flowing out of Jesus. And then in the early church as well, in Acts 4, we see, again, the apostles beginning to move in this kind of anointing. In Acts 4.12, it tells us, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. It was a real awe and sense of God's holiness and presence among them. Nevertheless, more and more people, men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought those who were ill out into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on them or some of them as he passed by. And crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing all those who were ill and tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Excuse me, just a moment. (laughs) Yeah, so just again, there's the apostles, they'd waited in Jerusalem for the Spirit to come. And as they went out, with that river flowing out of them, we just saw amazing signs and wonders among them. 
So they gained this reputation from the miraculous. Uh, you know, people, Peter had released healing to the crippled man at the gate beautiful. At the, t- at the temple, and word got around very quickly that this man who'd been begging there since he was a young man um, had been healed and was walking and praising God and all the rest of it. Um, so there were miracles happening as this fledgling church gathered together in the sort of on the in the outer courts of the temple. Uh, it was an incredibly exciting time that all God was doing through them. And then again, we see with Paul. Um, again, it, it talks about him moving in extraordinary, in extraordinary miracles and people taking handkerchiefs that he pl- prayed over and that the sick would be healed. <laughs> so, we're part of God's plan to restore humanity to relationship with him. And the way we do that is by actually representing him well, by hosting his presence. Each one of us, individually and corporately, we're a successor to the tabernacle and the temple. We're part of this fulfilled prophecy of the restoration of David's fallen tent. We are the place where God chooses to dwell in the earth. We're the place of unbridled worship, releasing the manifest presence of God. That's why we give so much of our corporate time together to worship. Spending time and just uh, giving space for us to encounter him together. It's just such a key um, to, to us being full and being able to release his spirit wherever we go. We want to be bathed in his presence, learning to be sensitive to him learning to recognize the ways he moves, learning to perceive into the spirit realm as well. You know, we're spiritual beings. We have this dual citizenship. We're citizens of earth, but actually we're citizens of heaven as well. And so we, we have this, um, yeah, we, we sometimes just need to tune in to what's happening in the spiritual realms as well. And even in our practical day-to-day life, we're actually designed to host his presence. You know, when you look in the early church and they, they got to a point where the church had grown so much and they were looking after people and doing lots of practical things and um, the apostles actually appointed people to kind of look after the practical stuff. But actually, the key qualification was they said, brothers and sisters, choose men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And we'll turn this practical responsibility over to them while we give attention to prayer and ministry of the word. And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. You know, we love to serve and to serve practically. But as we serve practically, we just so want to release something of the tangible love and presence of God wherever we are. You know, as I was sort of thinking about this morning, it struck me that actually we don't really talk much about the baptism of the Spirit. It's kind of one of those things we've begun to take for granted, really. Um, I remember as a, a Christian 40 years ago when I first got saved, it was a really contentious issue. I mean, you know, you were told that you were from the devil and all kinds of different things when you began to experience some of these things. And it's something I think that we, we do actually perhaps take for granted. Um, but I just want to raise that up there again. The, the early disciples, Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes on you and you receive power. And I think it's, we, can, we can get so caught up with all the things we do that we actually forget that we need this experience. Not just a one-off, but a continual being filled with the Spirit. Um, in, I think it's in Philippians or Colossians. It, it talks about that the Greek is... Keep on keeping on being filled. It's not just a one-off event, but actually we need to be constantly bathed with, with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and if that's not something you've experienced, we'd love to pray for you this morning, actually. I think it's something that um, it's just such a key for us to be able to live the life that, that uh, 
Jesus has for us. So I think I'm going to try and land this. So we are kind of part of God's story. We're part of God's uh, pursuit of mankind to release the presence of God, to release the knowledge of him, the knowledge of his glory um, in, in the earth. But hosting God's presence, I don't think, happens by accident. It's the outcome of a way of life. It's the outcome of our pursuit of him as well. We're so grateful that actually he takes the first steps. He reaches out to us. He, uh, his heart is towards us. But actually, we need to respond to him as well. <clears throat> you know, those moments of great presence in the Old Testament, they were actually preceded by periods of preparation, of sacrificial giving, of unity among the people. Same at Pentecost. Actually, these guys have been together praying in an upper room for weeks. You know, these guys, they'd gone into Jerusalem. They were there just waiting for God to come. God loves to come for us, but we need to hunger for him as well. So it does take preparation in our heart and sacrifice for us to love, to live in the fullness of this time to just allow our hunger to drive him, us towards him, to feed ourselves, to reach out in faith. Yes. Sometimes our faith is just reaching out when we don't feel him there, um, but just reaching out to him. Time to train our senses and to recognize the ways and the moving of the Holy Spirit and learning to daily live our lives sensitive to his voice and actions. It's an exciting journey. Um, we get it wrong sometimes, um, but there's always more of him to be experienced. Um, there's just something beautiful about the presence of God among his gathered people. There's something beautiful when you know, guys like Ben out on the streets, not even singing Christian songs, but releasing something of the, the power of God that he carries in his life. Each one of us, that's, that's our... That's our destiny, really, is just releasing the presence of God that's among us. Should we pray? Yeah, Father. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that actually your heart above all is to connect with your people, to connect uh, a lost world uh, to your love once more. And Father, I thank, that, thank you that you entrust that with, to your people. Thank you that you empower us. Thank you that your Holy Spirit lives within us. The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And Father, we just want to be sensitive to you. We want to hear you. We want to be aware of your presence more and more. Father, we want to release that presence knowingly and unknowingly, um, just everywhere we go. Father, again, just satisfy our hunger for more of you. <laughs> yeah, just that we would experience you in deeper ways, that we would see uh, fresh sides of who you are, new facets of your glory, um, receiving just those new blessings morning after morning. And Father, for those who've never experienced this, God, I just pray that right now your spirit would just begin to well up inside them. Holy Spirit, just fill each one of us. God, let it be our experience of your spirit welling up in us and overflowing. Yeah, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. Amen.